Today, it's a two for one video special day. We're gonna take a look at what I'm gonna be using for my home computer, well, one of them. I've got actually, my home setup is really kind of insane. This is just one piece of it. But first we're gonna take a look at the hardware because this is a perfectly reasonable Skylake build. And then we're gonna take a look at the software part of it for me, which is special and weird and probably, well, I'd probably describe it as a Lovecraftian horror. But more information about that after the bump. Thanks to Adorama for sponsoring this episode. They have a couple new wireless lavalier sets on their website that are really interesting, especially for SLR shooters. The road is simple, it just works, and it sounds really good. Plus, the range is about 100 meters, runs on AA batteries. We used it all over QuakeCon and had a lot of success with it. We're going to use that, and we're also going to use the Sennheiser AVX ME2 while we're in Germany. Now, this one is all metal construction. It's made in Germany, has XLR. And it comes with an adapter so that you can plug it right into your digital SLR. So both of these units are really interesting and attractive, especially for shooters uh, with SLR cameras. Both these units are uh, currently on sale, and they're new, so go ahead and check them out just by clicking on the screen or uh, click on the link in the description. So before we get into the Lovecraftian horror that is the software side, let's talk about the hardware side, because I figure most people, if they're going to put something together like this, they're just going to run Windows 8 or Windows 10 on it. They might run Linux on it, <laughs> and if you are going to run Linux on it, my second video is for you, definitely. But if you're going to run Windows 8 or Windows 10 on it, this is going to make a perfectly reasonable platform. So we're going to run through the actual setup of this machine and the hardware that was involved and why I sort of ended up with the hardware that I have. Now, as part of the Intel promotional package, they sent the Asus Z170 Deluxe, they sent the i7-6700K, they sent 16 gigabytes of Vengeance LPX RAM, that's Corsair, and they sent an Intel i750 SSD, which is a two gigabyte per second SSD, that's the new NVMe standard, it's a PCI Express type format. Uh, and that thing is smoking fast. So I basically decided to put this in a Lee and Lee A51 case. This is a compact ATX case. I'm not really a fan of like super tower cases because I don't really run a lot of hard drives or a lot of storage or a lot of peripherals in my computers. Micro ATX or mini ITX, actually I, I like those machines because for the type of workload that I do, those are usually more appropriate. But I really like the Lee and Lee case, the A51, because it's so small but it doesn't really sacrifice a lot. Now, for me, the power supply is in the front, and I think I would like the extra room around the expansion cards, so I'm probably going to mod this case and actually move the power supply up to the top. Now, for right now, I'm using the stock Intel cooler, which is sort of a misnomer because the Skylake CPUs don't actually ship with any cooler at all, so this is an older Intel cooler, but I'm getting the Corsair GTX 110i all-in-one liquid cooler, and then I'm gonna mount that 280 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler in the top of the case. And so it doesn't matter that I'll have less room for a CPU cooler because I'll be using the all-in-one liquid cooler and the power supply will be up near the top. Honestly, I think that this case would be the perfect case if it were more designed for an all-in-one liquid cooler and you'd have more room around the expansion slots. You could actually run SLI in this case, which would be insane. But for now, I'm using a Corsair 850 watt power supply. If I do SLI, I'll probably replace it with a thousand watt power supply, which yeah, I know is overkill, but the fans will be quieter. So don't really care. Now, for the Vengeance LPX memory, this is top shelf DDR4 memory. Intel sent a 4x4 kit. It's really, you can tell the Corsair has set up this kit for quad channel because it comes with two RAM coolers. It's made for like an X99 platform. And certainly X99 is still the performance king. At work, I'm still gonna be rocking my X99 systems in order to do work-related stuff. But for home stuff, which is, you know, light development and a little bit of gaming, Quad-core Skylake is basically okay. The big upgrade for me at home, because I was running Haswell, I know a lot of you out there at home are probably still running an i2600K or a Q6600 or, or maybe even something a little older than that, you know, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, oh, upgrade from Haswell. Yeah, I probably really didn't need to upgrade from Haswell, but one thing that's nice is this Intel SSD is really fast, and that's what most of the upgrades on this platform have been about. To move from Ivy Bridge to Sandy Bridge to Haswell, and beyond for the four core platform, not basically not the X99, X79, X58 platforms, not those platforms, but the quad core platforms, you know, for Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, what has been the mainstream uh, processor, Intel really hasn't been making the CPU a whole lot faster. For certain tasks, it's faster because they've added more instructions, they've added more silicon to deal with it. But what they've really been increasing the speed of is the peripherals, move, the move to PCI Express 3.0, the move from DMI 2.0 to 3.0 in Skylake. And that's what we really need for the PCI Express connectivity for the SSD. 
So prior to Skylake, if you wanted to take full advantage of the Intel SSD, you would have to plug it into one of the PCI Express slots that's wired directly into the CPU. So you've got your X16 slot for graphics. Well, no, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have by eight by graphics. And then the other slot that would normally be by eight will be by four for your PCI Express SSD. With the DMI 3.0 interface on Skylake, that tops out at about four gigabytes per second, and it has way lower overhead than the DMI 2.0 interface on Haswell and the Z97 chipset. So you can use that and actually take full advantage of the speed. If you wanna use it on Haswell, you really should be running the NVMe SSD, the PCIe NVMe SSD, off of one of the slots that's wired directly into your CPU, one of your, you know, PCI Express 3.0 slots. So I really, this, this particular memory kit that Intel included to show off Skylake is really kind of interesting because it is quad channel, but Skylake is not quad channel. So all four RAM slots are populated. I think if I were building the system, I probably would have opted for two eight gig sticks of RAM instead of four four gig sticks of RAM. Maybe even four eight gig sticks of RAM so I could have more room to, to move around. Now, in terms of like real world performance differences, what is the performance difference from DDR2133 to DDR4300? That's really not a lot. Now, this Vengeance kit is a blistering DDR4-3200. That's really fast for the, the current generation of, of, of DDR4-3200. And that's the out-of-the-box speed. You can actually up the voltage and push the clock speed a little beyond that even. It's a little tricky when you're wanting to overclock the RAM and you're, you've got all four slots populated, but it is doable. It is totally possible. For me, I found that actually tighter timings at DDR4-3000 were useful for my particular workload. But we'll talk about that more in the video. For gaming and, and ordinary tasks, there's still really not a lot of difference between DDR4-2133 all the way up through DDR4-3000-3200. That was the case with DDR3. That's still pretty much the case with DDR4. But even still, this is a premium memory kit and it comes with a cooler to help keep things cool. I mean, it's obviously designed for quad channel setup so that you're actually using both coolers, but for now, I'll just put the other cooler back in the box and wait until I use it on X99. Now, this is actually bundled with the Asus Z170 Deluxe. This motherboard is sort of the top end of the mainstream series from Asus. It's got built-in HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort. It's got a 3x3 dual-band Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth 4.0. It's got USB 3.1 Type-C and Type-A. There's actually a full review on our channel that covers all of the stuff. And I was really excited when I saw this because the Deluxe comes with a U.2 adapter, which is uh, the PCI Express adapter interface for the Intel 750 SSD. And so the, the version that we have here is a PCI Express add-in card. They've also got a more normal version that comes in a two and a half inch form factor. And I was really hoping that the two and a half inch form factor with the NVMe interface was the option that they'd opted for here. But it turns out that Intel actually sent the PCI Express version instead of the version that would use the U.2 interface. But this is still a really super deluxe top end motherboard. The Z170 Deluxe also has a ton of PCI Express 3.0 connectivity, and that's going to matter for what I'm going to do with this thing next in Linux. But if you want something that's a little bit more affordable, but still has some of the features of the Z170 Deluxe, like the five-way optimization and some of the other stuff, you should take a look at the Z170A. Now, the Z170A doesn't have as many USB ports and doesn't have the 3x3 connectivity, but it has a lot of the other bells and whistles that are found on the Z170 Deluxe. It doesn't come with a U.2 kit, so if you're going to get a 750 SSD, you would have to get the U.2 kit to get the adapter. Uh, and it, it doesn't come with like the hyper card thing to give you another add-in M.2 card or anything like that. Be sure to look at the specs, but it does have SATA Express and it does have the same connectivity so that you could actually connect a 750 SSD. Of course, if you're gonna get the PCI Express 750 SSD like what we have here, no problem. The one thing that I like about the Z170A over the Z170 Deluxe is that the Z170A has a PS2 keyboard port. So that's great for those of us that still enjoy rocking out on the Model M. One other cool feature about the Skylake platform is that it does support RAID with your NVMe U.2, M.2 interfaces for your SSDs. The problem is that, so like if we've got the Intel i750, that thing tops out at 2.2 gigabytes per second. If we've got two of those, we're looking at 4.4 gigabytes per second in a RAID 0 configuration. That's going to bottleneck our DMI 3.0 interface. Our DMI 3.0 interface tops out at about four gigabytes per second. Now, DMI 3.0 has very, very low overhead compared to DMI 2.0. DMI 2.0 at a maximum theoretical speed of two gigabytes per second, but you can mix and match. And so if you wanted to run your graphics card at by eight, 
you could use a PCI Express NVMe SSD in another by eight slot, and then you could use the U.2 interface for another Intel 750. And so that would be one way that you could run two Intel 750s, but that's pushing the bandwidth limits of what this platform has. Now with most graphics cards out today, you're not gonna have significant bottlenecking if you're running them at a by eight configuration. But if you really, really want a lot of bandwidth, you probably would be better off with an X99 platform, and then you're just dealing with straight PCI Express lanes. So, you know, you wanna run two NVMe you know i750s plus two graphics cards plus a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that's no problem you've got up to 40 pci express lanes on that configuration with this you've still got the 16 plus your dmi 3.0 which really gives you another four pci express lanes worth of bandwidth but that four pci express lanes worth of bandwidth is spread over all the peripherals in the system we've got a full overview of all that skylake stuff in our skylake video which hopefully i remember to link in the description so if you're really curious about skylake and why skylake and the cool stuff that it does you should check out that video because we covered that more completely there now in terms of doing your sky Lake build you know like I said the Vengeance LPX that's top shelf memory you may not need memory that fast you can substitute a lesser expensive RAM if it was me I would probably go for two 8 gig sticks instead of four 4 gig sticks don't know why Intel sent four 4 gig sticks I really think this is a, a kit that is designed for the x99 platform but you know then you can substitute the motherboard maybe you don't need u.2 support and maybe you don't need onboard wi-fi uh, you should take a look at other skylake motherboards and find a feature set that really fits you now for me i wanted good onboard video connectivity and so the hdmi 2.0 and the DisplayPort interface are basically gonna work out well. Now I've had mixed reports on Skylake in terms of HDMI 2.0 support if it truly is HDMI 2.0. I think it may be limited to 8-bit color depth, but maybe Intel can fix this in a, in a future revision or something. So I'm not really gonna say anything about the HDMI 2.0 interface support yet, but I will soon. Now in terms of graphics, because I plan to run Linux, I'm running the Asus Strix 390X. Now the 390X, because it's based on the Hawaii, it's you know rebadge of the 290X with faster RAM, it's really well supported on Linux because it's basically been out for a year. Right now, as of the making of this video, the Fury and the Fury X on Linux, a little sketchy, a little disappointing. So if you wanted to get the Fury or the Fury X on Linux, don't get any graphics card and just limp by on the onboard graphics. Use your old graphics card, whatever. Now in terms of NVIDIA, you could run NVIDIA in this just as easily. You, if you're gonna just put Windows on this machine, you could get a 980 Ti. That's the current best performing least headache card on the market. However, under Linux, the 980 Ti, for what I wanna do, I, I can't recommend NVIDIA for what I'm actually gonna do. And you'd have to learn more about why in our second video. But for me, for what I'm gonna do, NVIDIA is just not an option under Linux. The ASUS Strix 390X, I've been very happy with that under Linux. It's actually worked well for what I'm doing with it. So all in all, this is sort of a fun build to do. Now I'm gonna modify this case to move my power supply and I'm gonna install the GTX 110i. So you'll probably be seeing this system in a couple other videos before I can actually take it home. So it'll probably actually be several months before I can take it home. Eventually this is gonna be my main home computer. Now in terms of the display, I'm using a 4K A399H. If you guys haven't seen a video on that, you should totally check that out. I haven't decided if I'm gonna have one or two extra displays. I've got a crossover ultra wide screen that makes a really good secondary display that's like above the 4K display, but I've also got a few of these 23 inch Dell monitors. Now these Dell monitors are special. The resolution is 2048 by 1152. It's kind of an unusual resolution, but these make really great portrait monitors because they're so wide. If you use a 1920 by 1080 monitor on its side at 1080p, it's just not quite wide enough for web pages, but this monitor at 1154 makes all the difference in the world when you're using it in portrait for web pages. Now, if you've got a 1920 by 1200 display, that's even better. You can use that in portrait and it'll work great. But these 23 inch monitors match up in terms of screen size fairly well with the 2160p of the 4K. So that's what I'm gonna be using for the side monitors in this configuration. And then of course I'm rocking the venerable IBM Model M for my keyboard. Well, if you have any questions or you're gonna build your own and you have questions, head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. We'll see you there. I'm Wendell, signing out. <laughs>